We come to a section now that is very confusing for Westerners reading a 2,000-year-old letter. All right, so let's try to unpack maybe the principles here that might apply to you and me. There were certain customs that each of these Greco-Roman cities held to. And one of the customs particular to the city of Corinth had to do with covering of a woman's head. Now, I heard Fuchsia Pickett years and years ago give some historical background about this that I thought was fascinating. That historical background was that if you were in that time in the city of Corinth uh, found to be an adulteress, then part of the punishment was to shave your head. If you were a temple prostitute, a female temple prostitute, the same thing. Cut the hair, shave the head. So that in the city of Corinth, if a woman had short, very short, or shaved head, it was dishonorable because it was a sign that she's either cheated on her husband or she is a temple prostitute. Now, these people get saved. They come into the church. What's Paul going to do? Because they're worshiping with women that have long hair, that have stayed faithful to their husband. They're not temple prostitutes. Right across the aisle from them in this seat is a converted temple prostitute, uh, perhaps someone that has uh, stepped out on their husband, and so you see the women here that have the short hair, shaved head, and you have the others here that have long hair. And you can kind of see that in that environment, it would be very difficult to keep these two different groups from creating factions. And so you have the faction of the trustworthy women, the honorable women because of their hair, and then you have the dishonorable women because of their short hair or their shaved heads. So Paul comes up with a solution. Have everybody wear hats. I think it's brilliant. Have everybody have a head covering. Now, when that happens, of course, you can see that now you can't tell what someone's past is because it doesn't matter. Whatever they've done in their past doesn't matter. We all have a past. We all have been saved from something, redeemed from something, walked away from something. So every woman wears a head covering, and that way there is no contention, at least as much, between those that have stayed faithful and they're not prostitutes versus those that were. Now, the bigger picture here then is why does Paul make these statements? And when you read this, it, it really is confusing because he's interacting between the physical reality and the practical problem that he's addressing back and forth into spiritual principles. And so he's taking spiritual principles and practical problems, and he's kind of intertwining the two, and he goes back and forth with telling us, uh, uh, for instance, that as a husband, I am submitted to God and I am responsible to God to treat my wife and my family as Christ treated the church. My family then, and my wife in particular, then she comes into alignment with me, and she relates to me as I relate to Christ. And that principle is in verse 1, where Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. So no problem there, except that he's weaving in and out of a proper alignment for humanity in terms of our personal relationship with God, and then how that personal relationship with God aligns with the family unit, and then how the family unit aligns with the church community, and then how the church community interacts with the broad culture and population around them. So Paul is addressing a problem in the church where in the culture the length of a woman's hair said something about her. And Paul says, we'll have them all wear hats. That's how we'll deal with that. In that context, well, what do you do with the men? Well, 
you know, the men, that's not quite as much of a problem culturally. So the men, don't worry about wearing hats. In fact, leave the hats off. When you pray, when you prophesy, when you speak, you don't have to cover your head. But ladies, it's probably a good idea that if you're going to prophesy or pray in church or draw attention to yourself, is essentially what he's saying, then it's probably best for you to have your head covered. Now, I hope that maybe brings a little clarity. It's not easy, but I think the conclusion is this, that Paul was bringing what, what at its core is a, is a Jewish morality and Jewish ethic through Christ becoming what's called Judeo-Christian morals and ethics into a completely pagan culture. And when that happens, you have to be an expert on both things. What the Scripture teaches and how the culture expresses itself. And when those two begin to merge, <clears throat> what you find is that there are certain redeemable qualities in every culture that should be embraced. But there's also features within every culture that come in conflict with what the Bible says or what we're calling Judeo-Christian ethics and morals. They're in conflict with those Judeo-Christian morals, and those things need to be addressed and changed in the community of the church and then outside that community as it bleeds into the greater society or culture. That's what Paul is doing here. And I, then I think that the way that he concluded this is the most proper way, and I don't know if you noticed in verse 16, it says, but if anyone seems to be contentious, like if the whole head covering thing is not for you, we have no such custom, nor do the churches of God. Well, Paul's addressing something, but he's not addressing it per se with the authority of the Lord. He's trying his best to say, here's the particular situation in Corinth. And by the way, none of the other churches had these same customs because they didn't have the same issues that Corinth had. And so Paul is addressing these issues with Scripture in a way that hopefully solves that problem or brings some relief to the problem. But then in the end, he says, you know, I'm not going to claim scriptural or godly or divine authority on this. You're going to have to figure it out. Um, well, I think that's a proper way to think about things in our life, right? Because ultimately, it's not what I'm saying. It's what the scripture says. Well, tell me what the scripture says, Pastor Mark. Well, I try, but ultimately... You're on your own. You've got to make up your own mind. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Like yesterday, this passage is very exclusive towards its application to the Corinthian people. So it appears here's what's happening. In the early church, unlike us, communion to them, the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist, was a meal, a literal meal. Now, we symbolize that today with a little piece of unleavened bread and, and a little cup of juice, but in that day, it was a love feast. It was one day a week where the Christians would assemble and they would sing very much, uh, very much related to the Jewish synagogue services where there would be singing, there would be scripture reading, and then there would be a rabbi that would speak and talk and teach. But also, they would eat together, I would think probably after the service, kind of like we do when we have special occasions and we used to, as a kid, have dinner on the grounds. And so that would then be followed by a song fest normally in a Sunday afternoon. Well, this is what the church did every week. And why did they do that? Well, they wanted to carry on perhaps the tradition that was established in the Church of Jerusalem in Acts chapter 2, where people broke bread together from house to house. And so they wanted to, they wanted to keep that tradition alive. Perhaps it had a very practical application, and that is that much of the church was comprised of the slave class. Well, I'm sure that that one meal that they had during the week on their worship day, the Lord's Day on Sunday, that might have been the best meal they had all week. So they probably really looked forward to that meal throughout the week. 
And then it brought a kind of unity, a, a single class of people in the church. So we say when we serve the Lord's Supper, we're coming to the same table. We don't have a table for good people and a table for bad people. We have one table. It's for bad people. And that is people that need a Savior, people that know that they have sinned, come short of the glory of God. And they know that Jesus is the Savior. So we come to the same table. It's communion, which means we commune together, community. We're all in this together. We're all equal. At the Lord's table, we're all the same. So this was an incredible uh, alternative way of seeing the world than what the Greco-Roman world how they saw the world. This was an incredibly revolutionary kind of perspective that you had slave owners and slaves communing at the same table, eating at the same table. That didn't happen in those cultures, but it did in the church, and that's why the church was an alternative culture. It, it was, it, you know, you might even say a counterculture, and uh, there were things, as I said yesterday, that are redeemable in every culture, but then there's things that are not redeemable in every culture. Okay, so What's going on here? Well, what's going on here is that the slave class, those families, were coming to the dinner and people weren't sharing their food with them. So you had wealthy citizens who would bring uh, three or four bottles of wine, uh, a great spread of bread and meats and vegetables and fruits, but they would cloister themselves off somewhere else. And then the poorer families... They would kind of push aside into another place. So Paul addresses this and says, you know, some people will come to the dinner and they don't even get food, their whole family. Yeah, they may have 12 kids and all they can afford to bring is a bag of chips. But the wealthy Christians should have enough compassion to say, well, if I can afford more, I'm going to give more so that I can help pull people up. And, you know, that essentially is why God blesses us with wealth, not to Make us feel better about ourselves, but so we can help other people. The Eucharist, the Lord's Supper, was the perfect opportunity to do that, but these people were blowing it. They weren't comprehending it. They didn't understand the nature of the body of Christ because while some people were hungry, the poor people maybe that lived in the city that weren't slaves uh, but were the plebeian class, and then you had the slaves they were going hungry, and then you have the wealthy people over here. They have so much wine, they're getting drunk. So literally at the church dinner, you had a drunken fest on one side and people watching it and starving on the other. And that shouldn't happen. And this is what Paul is addressing. And this is what we need to understand or comprehend if we are going to be the body of Christ. The subject of the Lord's Supper is still in question in this passage. And I explained yesterday that the issue was that there were wealthy citizens that had plenty of food that actually had so much wine that they were drunk at the church dinners. And then there were the other people who were plebeian, maybe free citizens, but very poor, or the slave class, who had nothing, and so they came and went hungry. So Paul then begins this passage with talking about the Lord's Supper and what it was meant to be, and that is following the words of Jesus that this is my body and my blood. So that means that when we are partaking of this together, then we are actually ingesting and taking on the very nature of Christ, body and blood. We are covenanting with God, but we're also in the process covenanting with each other. What's happening here is that the people didn't discern that. They didn't discern and understand that what they're doing is partaking in something that's so serious in the name of Jesus, ingesting the food and the drink as a representation of us taking on the nature of Christ they didn't understand that to the point that they were just gorging themselves while others starved. Now, I think we can just relate this into our setting pretty easily, and that is that people gorge on the gospel, gorge on teaching, gorge on all of the worship to simply satisfy themselves and to make themselves feel better, but have never, ever, ever one time won anyone to Jesus Christ. 
And I think we could squarely put ourselves right there in that passage. Because the gospel is for you, but the gospel is not about you. The gospel is about laying down your life and following Christ. These people didn't discern that. Who knows? I mean, is someone really converted that lives that way? That goes to the church dinner and doesn't care about those people who have nothing to eat and I'm going to gorge myself and drink so much wine that I'm drunk? I mean, is that person even even really born again? I mean, that's a good question. Because if you're born again, you come to a place where you completely give yourself to Jesus Christ. And this is why I think that Paul uses the word examine. Examine yourself. Because if you can comfortably gorge yourself until you're full and overflowing and you don't care about someone in your church that doesn't have enough to eat and they're standing over there with their children in sight of you while you gorge yourself, well, something's wrong with you. Like this, You're not discerning, these are Paul's words, you're not discerning, understanding the body of Christ. And again, Paul, as I talked about a couple of days ago, begins to merge spiritual principles with earthly practical issues. And discerning the body of Christ is more than just knowing what the bread stands for and the little cup of juice stands for. It means we are ingesting Christ because we are Christ followers. What that means is he is our Lord. He's our example. We examine ourselves constantly to make sure that we are following Christ in his footsteps to the best of our ability, which means what? It means we take up the cross too. His blood becomes our blood. His broken body becomes our broken body. And just as the broken body and the blood remind us of what he did sacrificially on the cross, we in turn follow his example. We give ourselves away. We give our lives away. We don't even own ourselves. We've been bought with a price. This isn't my body. It's his body. This is not my blood. It's his blood. It belongs to him. And if you're acting in a way where you just gorge on the gospel and worship and preaching just to satisfy yourself, but you've never won anyone to Jesus. You've never volunteered in your local church. You've never given yourself away and put yourself out with time and effort and money to help someone else. Well, maybe you need to re-examine what it is that you're eating and drinking. And then Paul makes a very startling conclusion. He says, this is why many of you are sick and sleep. And he's not talking about sleeping off the drunk that you had the day before at church. No, he's, he's talking about death. Well, I mean, this moves into a level of seriousness you just can't even overstate. There's something of an umbrella of protection when we live right in the body of Christ, in the church. There's something of a protection. But when we step out from under that protection, that umbrella, it may be sun shining, it may be a dark day, but no rain. But sooner or later, you're going to get rained on. So stay under the umbrella. Live right. Follow Christ. And when we take communion together, that little piece of bread, that little cup, just remember, we are ingesting the body and the blood of Jesus to give our lives away, just like he did.